Actress Jessica Oyello is known for her roles in Churchill, Alice in Wonderland, and Sleepy Hollow. She is even more known by the countercultural lifestyle that her and her A-list husband, the actor David Oyello, live. I'm going to ask Jessica about their faith journey when they left a comfortable life in the UK behind and moved to Los Angeles to pursue film and television full-time. We're going to discover together what it looks like to be a famous family in Hollywood. And because Jessica lives a life of vulnerability, I'm going to investigate her personal struggle of significance when she had to lay down her own career and agenda while her husband's career soared. Now, though, she's living out an explosion of God activity as she and her husband are producing dozens of film and TV projects. Join me today on Exploring the Industry. Welcome to Exploring the Industry. I'm so excited to have Jessica Oyelowo today. Hi. We were talking about how we met in 2007, we yes, think. we think. <laughs> My first memory of meeting you is after I moved to the States and we came to your house to have a prayer meeting. Yeah. And you guys came here and you started um, connecting behind the scenes to a lot of really amazing people as well mm -hmm. who are Christians in the industry. And you had a heart to see what God could do here, not just pursue your careers. Absolutely. That's, that's is, all we came to see is what God can do. I, I uh, look through the Bible and I look at who had which career and I'm like, nobody really had careers in the Bible. Nobody like pursued uh, a particular dream. They pursued God. Yeah. And then God did whatever he needed to do to make his purposes happen in their lives, which end up often being careers or callings or destinies, whatever you want to call them. But no, we did not come here to pursue careers uh, wow. in that sense of it. We knew we were coming here to be part of the entertainment industry, but we knew we had to let God do whatever he wanted to do within the entertainment industry and use us as he chooses. No, yeah, it was super risky because you brought your family over Yeah, <laughs> and you weren't coming to a job. You just came because nope. God showed you to come. Yes. And at the time, I remember David was saying, they keep asking me to play like gangsters. That's all that's here for African origins is like people who are the next bad guy in the movie. There was like nothing in England at the time. And he knew that part of coming out here was like a different type of role that he would play. But you also have been an actor since you were a child, like so young. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, uh, it was an interesting transition. Um, we were working at quite a high level in the UK, yeah. having both been called into the industry in the first place. My husband was going to be a lawyer. Oh, wow. And I was going to study politics, philosophy, and economics. Oh, my gosh. And not have anything to do with it because it's the entertainment industry. It's evil, right? We're not allowed to yeah. be part of this. Those We're Christians. Days, yeah. I was raised in a home where um, we really, really loved the Lord. And my parents really taught me the word. Morning and evening, the whole family sitting down reading the wow. Bible together. Wow. Every day. Wow. And I'm so, so grateful for that. My grandmother, grandfather, my great grandmother, all missionaries in China, my parents as well. And um, the idea of me becoming an actress mm -hmm. was so heinous to my grandmother, particularly. <laughs> no, I get it. My mom, when we told my mom we were coming out here, my mom, <laughs> it was like 15 years ago. No, it was 25 years ago. My mom started crying and said, why would you ruin your destiny or your life? But I think now that we're out here, I know you've run the same thing where there's like, we've run over 150 kids who are pastor's kids and mm -hmm. apostles' kids, missionaries' kids, whatever. They're from all, all They're all here. And it's interesting because they have like the same kind of calling their parents had to go into ministry. Yes. And it's again, that's the thing you're talking about where yes. here you are, a second or third generation person. Missionary. And, yeah, missionary. And I remember we talked about that when you first came out as like, you're a missionary here. Yeah. Totally. And how are you going to reach the people you're called to spread the gospel to if you're not going to get to know them and be part yeah. of their world? Like if you're going to go to Papua New Guinea and live with a, live with the Stone Age tribe, yeah, you have to live with the Stone Age tribe and understand them and understand their ways and what's happening in their lives so that you can be effective in your communication yeah. with them of the gospel. I don't agree with everything that's going to be happening in that New Guinean Absolutely. tribe. I'm not going to partake in everything that they're going to be doing in their daily life. And I'm not going to partake in everything that's happening in Hollywood. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Just to make that clear. Exactly. But, yeah. <laughs> but the same rules apply. Yeah. Especially Christians have been told over and over and over that the city's evil. Yes. And the industry is evil. So it's hard for them to disconnect that. So I think you guys are really pioneering for probably not just your families, but other people, because we want a generation from now to go, yes, we're empowered to go. Right. And you guys kind of had a price to pay. Yes, we so did. What was that like for your family? Like what happened? Well, 
for the for the beginning of our careers, my husband's family were very against him becoming an actor. Wow. My parents were supportive because I'd always been a performer. My mother came in one time. I was, I think, four, three or four years old. It must have been four because I'd started violin lessons at this point. And I had pulled the poor mailman who'd come to deliver a parcel into the living room and was saying, <laughs> do you want me to sing, dance, or play my violin for you? <laughs> she probably loved it. And my, my life was, I want to make your life a little bit happier. I want to wow. make you a little bit more cheerful today. So yeah. let me let me <laughs> shine some sparkle and dust on that. So my parents weren't quite so surprised yeah. when the Lord was like, acting, go. David and I met in the National Youth Music Theatre doing the Three Penny Opera, which is a big Brechtian wow. thing. When we were teenagers, we were 17 and 18 when we met. Wow. And we were the only Christians in the show. Now, how did he get into the show? Because his parents were against him acting. Yeah. He, he, it, he actually got a scholarship from the Prince's Trust, Prince Charles's oh. Trust. And anything to do with royalty or scholarships, my father-in-law is like, Go. Okay, go for it. Do. <laughs> God had to use the sneaky way. <laughs> he, he snuck him in all <laughs> kinds of ways. And my grandmother, who was an amazing woman, she went off to China as a single lady wow. to serve the Lord as a nurse. And she ended up meeting my grandfather there, who was a doctor, and they married and had my dad there. He lived there for some years. Um, she was a great woman, but the traditional thought process around mm -hmm. this industry is it's evil. Yeah. It's just evil. Um, and so she disowned me as a prostitute. Oh, oh. <laughs> she called me a prostitute. Oh, that's and super painful. It was super painful at the time, but, um, did you have grace or was that? No, I had, I understood where she was coming okay. from. It was hard for her. She didn't understand. So you finally yes. made it into the entertainment industry. Yes. You had the resistance from family. They didn't fully understand. You and David were in England. You felt to come over here. What makes you make that big of a jump? Is it just raw obedience or was there anything that was leading you? We had um, this American manager came over to see his friend in the UK and say, who have you got on your client list that you think would work in the States? And he introduced him to David, my husband. David spent the whole meeting talking about me because I'm awesome. <laughs> and so he wanted to meet me too. We we're yeah. both actors, both working at a really high level in the UK, doing film and plays yeah. and theater and TV and radio. I don't get to do that very much here. <laughs> radio plays still, still happen <laughs> in the amazing. UK. <laughs> um, so he met us and he just said, think about it. And we were like, mm, we'll pray about it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Cause I was in no hurry to move. We just had our first child, very connected, loved our lives, loved uh, where we lived. There was nothing that was unhappy about wow. our lives. It was an amazing life <laughs> that we had. We were just like, yay, this is awesome. I, I like that you're saying because a lot of people who do move here move because they're hoping it'll get better. Yeah. And no. you guys moved here because God called you. We prayed and the Lord, yeah. and David said, I really think we should give this a try. And I was like, no, I don't want to. This is too lovely. Our yeah. lives are good and it's yeah. going to be hard out there. England has a small industry. We knew everyone. We knew all the casting directors. Yeah. We were friends with everybody at that point. It was a, a hard decision to make, but um, we prayed and the Lord spoke to us and he started showing us scriptures. My heart is beating fast. Exodus 23, 20, where he talks, uh, the Lord is saying, I'll send my angel before you to lead you in the way you should go. Yeah. To get from Egypt to the promised land, there's the wilderness years of just having God here, like meeting Jesus face to face yeah. and living, following the cloud, following the fire, stopping when he says stop, going when he says go, relying on his provision, having nothing for tomorrow. So we pray, we pray, we pray. We come out here for a summer, like two, three months. And we feel really strongly that we need to start the green card process. We start the green card process, we sold everything in the UK, moved everything over here and decided that this is, if this is where the Lord has called us to, this is our home and we're in all the way in. Yeah. So we arrived to an economic crash and the writers, I remember the writer's strike, the writer's strike, no work, no, no. money, no prospects, another baby on the way. Um, and so the faith journey really began. 
But you know what? I don't see too many people in scripture that manage to fulfill their destiny staying at home. <laughs> it's true. They are all called out away from where they've come from to somewhere completely different because we have to live a life where we are completely reliant on the Lord. Staying in England would have been a really lovely life for me. Yeah. But it wouldn't have been God's highest and best for me. It would have been great and he would have been happy. But if I'm truly going to trust and obey him in in every possible way, which I firmly believe is the best way to live the Christian life, is to just obey him no matter what. Because if he said he's going to do it, he's going to do it. Then um, I want to be part of that and I want to go through what needs to be gone through. (laughs) <laughs> you're like I'm willing to surrender which is huge yeah. I mean like that's that's the thing that I feel you guys have always carried this you've carried a level of just I would call it spiritual wisdom of just human wisdom with spiritual understanding of how to live life there's just nothing yeah. better than than walking through this life with God and becoming one with him mm-hmm. I mean it's mind blowing it's absolutely mm-hmm. mind blowing so David, his career, because you guys both, in some ways, I've I've heard from your mutual friends that, especially in England, you guys were at the same kind of place. We were. And then you've allowed the career side to run ahead because you're so about family. Totally so about family. But what so is that family. like as but far I've, as, because you still have this other calling that's part of the whole root system of it. And yes. you have got to pop in a few times, but there's this whole part of you that you've allowed to be on hold because this is what takes priority. I felt like the Lord is saying, just stop. You just be with your family right now. You support David pursuing this call on his life. So we moved in May 8th, 2007. And on July 24th, the Lord spoke to David when he read the script, Selma, when it first came across our path. You're going to play Martin Luther King in this movie, Selma. And he Mm -hmm. was like, I just got here. No one has a clue who I am. I'm not American. I'm a Nigerian British guy. Who's going to hire me to play this role? But okay, I'm going to write this down and I'm going to pray and I'm going to see what you're going to do. That journey was one where the Lord took him to school and trained him to be ready to play Martin Luther King by giving Mm. him all these little jobs in The Help, in Red Tails, in uh, The Butler, in Lincoln. Which they were all very African-American centric. African-American Because remember he told history. me in the beginning, it's like, if I was ever asked to play an African-American role, I don't know that I can even relate completely because no. I wasn't here. I didn't grow up here. No, and it's entirely different to grow up in England and Nigeria, which yeah. he did, where you're the majority, where he's from a royal family. He has a completely different outlook on life compared to people who are forcibly, their ancestors forcibly brought over to this country. Yeah and enslaved for generations and generations. It does something to your psyche and your DNA that is entirely unimaginable for anyone that hasn't been through that. Yeah. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. Yeah. David does not have that as part of his ancestry. He doesn't have that pain. So for him to embody someone who was helping others overcome that was such a, a, an honor and a big deal for him, and he was mm. fully aware. So all those movies that led up to that role, they were the training ground. That was training ground, but wow. you know, you're not getting paid much for being in the help when you've got a few scenes. And but he was cast in the help because they said, "Oh, you're the guy that's going to play Martin Luther King. We want you to play a preacher. Can you write your own sermon, and we'll put it oh, in the wow. movie?" <laughs> wow. So if you watch the help and you see David in that, he has this little scene where he's he's literally preaching the gospel. Yeah. He's pre and he wrote, he got to write the scene. That's amazing. I didn't know that. <laughs> but wow. throughout that time, we uh, had to take our kids out of school. We had another child, so we've got four kids running around the country in these tiny independent movies or slightly bigger so you movies. Were taking still, them with taking with, and I was homeschooling them. Wow! It felt like an enormous sacrifice on my part, which isn't a good thing to be thinking. Yeah. Like, I'm laying down my life and my calling for you so you can fulfill yours is a terrible way to think. Yeah. It's deadly. It's actually deadly. And there were times where I was bitter and upset about the whole thing because I moved to America not wanting to, following the call of the Lord, and then I'd be praying going, why am I here? Yeah. Why am I here? I could have looked after my kids. Yeah, I could be looking after my kids in England. They could be in school. 
I could be hanging out with my mom. She could be yeah. helping with the kids. They can have relationships so with real. their cousins. Yeah. And I'm running around the country, living in Louisiana, in Alabama, in Georgia, in Mississippi, in all over the place, yeah. all over the country where I don't know anyone, uh, raising my kids in as, in as godly way as I possibly can. But knowing that I was harboring resentment and bitterness, that was not a healthy time. Wow. It was difficult. But the Lord would keep taking me back to Exodus. Be like, you're in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. I need you here. You're in the prison, as it were. Not yeah. that my kids are a prison. My kids are amazing. No, but I think everybody understands the context of it. Yeah. It's the Joseph... I have a call on my life. Okay, go be sold into slavery and then into prison and then you can fulfill the call. Yeah. It's the, you need to stop now. You need to rest. Even though you feel like you're in prison, I need to teach you things that you can't wow. learn if you're out there in the world, as it were, doing your thing, fulfilling, fulfilling your destiny. It's not my destiny. It's mm -hmm. his kingdom and it's his destiny. And that, is what happened in that period of time where the shift came from you called me to do this and I want to do this and I need to be doing this for you to yeah. whatever you want is what I'm going to do. And if it's to stay here and to have 20 more babies, that's what I'm going to do. And 20. <laughs> that's that's actually not humanly possible <laughs> at this point. But... I realized I was holding resentments that needed to be put to death. Yeah. Scripture's very clear about what we do with our flesh. Mm -hmm. It isn't to kind of try and gently rest it into a sleep so that it doesn't bother us anymore. It's like get out the knife, stab Kill it her. in the heart, yeah. bury it and walk away. Like it's violent talk because our carnal nature is a violent Thing. Oh yeah, it's and it keeps at, you in such a prison. It's an it's, yeah. it's at enmity with God. So I, if I'm, if I'm going to be friends with my flesh, I'm an enemy of God. Yeah. I have to choose to kill the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> so I had this moment where I was like, I'm going for prayer. I'm going for in it like an intense inner healing thing, and I'm going to repent. I love that. I'm just going to repent. I'm going to repent of everything, and I'm going to understand that doesn't matter what is inside me that even if God has put it there, it belongs to him. Our lives are not our own. I don't yeah. get to choose. But that surrender is, I think, one of the hardest things for people who do family in the industry because yeah. you have like, like you have some family members who will sacrifice their children at the altar of their career, destiny, whatever Ooh. they want to call it. And that's what we've dealt with. And one of the reasons why it's so broken because in those people end up in the industry too, even though they don't want to be the way they are. And they end up creating things out of that place of brokenness. And we've had that perpetual cycle now for generations. There's something about a lot of people who may not see the side of it because like you're, they're just watching their yellow old family. It's blowing up. Oh, the opportunities. They'll see you pop into acting every once in a while. David's in all these major movies. And they don't realize the price you're paying, that there's a, multiple prices. There's multiple levels of what you're doing this for Jesus because you are missionaries, like yes. you're saying. And that's, I think it's a huge picture people don't know. Yeah, for sure. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a little break and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk some more about the entertainment industry. Got it. Love it. Wow. That was awesome. So here we go. I have a game for you. Okay. It's very serious. We're, <laughs> we're going to play something real, something fake. I'm going to tell you real and fake facts about things related to your life. And you have to decide. <laughs> You're like, what is this going to be? You have to decide. What's true and what's not? This is going to be very exciting. So, Holy Spirit, help me. <laughs> you can't use a God card on okay, this one. Okay, no, okay. I'm just kidding. No. You and your beautiful family now reside in Tarzana, California, the valley. Yes, we do. We have a valley fact and a Tarzana fact, and you have to decide which one is true. Okay. So we have the Southern California community of Tarzana was so named after the famous ape man, Tarzan. 
character created by Edgar Rice Burroughs, one of the town's early residents. That's fact number one. Mm -hmm. Fact number two, Tarzana is part of the area that Valley Speak or Valley Talk originated. Valley Girls is an American dialect originally of the San Fernando Valley, including Tarzana. It is associated with young upper class white women called Valley Girls. Um, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> like, you mean Valley yes. Girls? You okay. Could be one. This um, is so good. I would say fact one is true. Fact one is true. 100%. You are a Valley Girl. Look at this. And they actually have. Valley dudes. Are your boys becoming valley dudes at all? <laughs> no. no, thank God. My eldest still has an English accent. He said to me when oh, he was oh. five, we moved to him when he was five, he's 17 now. He goes, Mommy, I'm never going to lose my accent. You must tell me if oh, I, I ever that. sound American. <laughs> no, my right. favorite thing when you guys first came, we were first meeting, I actually asked both of you to do American accents. And you do really, obviously, you just did one. You do such good accents. Like, it's so I great. I love accents. Oh, they're the best. And I can't you do You can ask one. me to do any accent. Have I ever done my English accent for you? I wish you would. Please don't ever ask me to do it because Sean, it sounds like Sean, will you please do an English accent? Terror. Oh, it's the worst. It's the it's my wife. And my wife gets. Here's what I do. This is all I can do. This is terrible. It's like hello. <laughs> I can't even do it. Hello. Good day. <laughs> like, totally. I sound like what well, you know. All I want is I'm <laughs> somewhere. Like I sound like Cockney. <laughs> terrible. Like I was listening to Chris Pratt doing an interview um, <laughs> over on the Grand Norton show, and he could actually do a perfect like Cockney accent to the point. Wow. It was crazy. And I said, I wish I could at least do a perfect Cockney accent, anything. You well, know? tomorrow no. I'm going to go to my son's school and teach the cast of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang <laughs> to do English accents <laughs> properly. Awesome. So anyone wants to join, oh I can gosh. teach you. I would love to learn. Okay, here we go. So out of those two, the number one was true. Edgar Rice Burroughs, yes. who actually did create Tarzan, actually did own some land developments, but they did not name it after him. So no, but they named it after Tarzan. Oh. Here's an interesting one. You're married to David Oyelowo, who is best known for Selma, Red Tails, and many other movies. We want to see if you know how tall the world thinks he is. <laughs> According to Celebrity Birthdays, he is 5'7". According well, to Celebrity Facts online, he is 6'1". Which one do you think is true? <laughs> they are both true online. That's what no. they say. <laughs> He's 6'1 and 5'7"? Yeah, I was like, that's, that's a, a big, big, diverse... Range. I was looking at that facts about hilarious. him just because I thought it'd be funny to bring something on here. I'm like, wow, he's so many different heights. There was three different heights he had on three different sites, and I just added two of them. I was like, I wonder how, I think he's like 5'10, right? It's 5'9. Okay, 5'9. He right thinks around he's there. seven foot tall. So <laughs> he is a basketball player. The the six one was closer to his imagination. 5'7, he would be gutted. He would be devastated. That's like <laughs> those two inches five, are. 5'7 is Tom Cruise. That's that's mm -hmm. tiny me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like I'm six foot four. So that's like when I'm around somebody who's really I was around someone yesterday who was tiny. very little compared to me. Mm -hmm. And and people don't like to be thought of as little. Nope. <laughs> Men don't like that. Mm -mm. No, but five nine is he's he's a good stature. He's good, that's a good stature. I hate the word average, but sorry babes. <laughs> Pretty average. That's amazing. Well thank you for playing our game with us. You're welcome. <laughs> One of the things I'm excited about is when we do these table talk type times, we get to hear about things that are projects you're working on, but also the behind the scenes reasons why. Mm. So you guys started a production company mm -hmm. recently in the last couple of years? We've kind of always had one in our back pocket in England. We started a youth theater ourselves, having oh, wow. been so profoundly affected by a youth theater in Brighton, where we lived on the South Coast. We started the Brighton Dome Youth Theater. Nice. And actually, one of our alumni has carried it on. Oh, He's, it's amazing. He now so has the Brighton there. Youth Theatre that he runs. And I saw him a couple of weeks ago. He was out here doing a play. Nice. So, yeah, we, we've we always had production in mind, something where we um, aren't acting solely. Because um, as an actor, you can feel like a cog in somebody else's machine. For sure. And um, you have to do your part and you serve the story and you do everything you can to make that story fly. Yeah. But how about being the person who gets to tell the story in the first place and create the story yeah. and be the person who gets to create parables, essentially modern day parables um, and difficult stories and exploring uh, people's lives that traditionally Christians wouldn't necessarily explore. Okay, tell one of those then, because that's like, what does that mean? Because it's very, you're, you're speaking very cryptic and I'm excited about it. It's like, what are you working on? This is awesome. Well, we we now have a production company. Um, we have 16 movies and 13 TV shows in oh, development. Wow. 
just a few. Just a few. <laughs> um, David and I have always felt this is partly the the pain behind not being able to com- f- fulfill my career moment. Yeah. Um, was we knew that we were called to do something together. Mm-hmm. Um. And, you know, David has had his own journey. While I was going through what I was going through, he was going through all kinds of crazy too. I'm sure. And we both had to reach a, a point where we're uh, ready yeah. to partner in a very real way on content creation. I'm just going back to our, our story we were talking about before and how much of a price you had to pay and actually like let God do this identity work and learn about the Exodus journey. And then all of a sudden, it's not just about coming here and acting. It's actually coming here to be moms and dads and actually create content. Yep. That's amazing. Amazing. Wow. It's a it's a really interesting journey to go on to be ready to to tell a story from the ground yeah. up and not just be part of telling that story yeah it was that's relatively easy for me as an actress acting has comes naturally and I've done lots of work and it's you know something I can do yeah um so then to learn how to get behind the camera how to make every frame tell the story how to write how to produce how to make a budget work how to do all the things that need to how to build relationships with financiers and um executives and all kinds of no it's huge things. the whole it's business huge. of the industry it is it, so how creating. many of these projects are faith-based very None few no it's amazing i'm, I'm loving it. it's it, one of the reasons why we did this show is because we're actually trying to show people who are mostly not faith-based in the different industries in the sense of like Christians, you don't call a football player, a Christian sport. You just say a Christian football player, you know, he's a Christian and someone's (laughs) film. There's, there's whole shows dedicated to faith-based shows. And that's great. Yeah. But I love that you guys are going after something because as missionaries, you have to tell stories that actually culturize culture Yeah. that aren't, you know, so agenda driven. I wouldn't say it's hard to answer because they're not faith-based as in this story is about Jesus but they are always about Jesus. Yeah, they're you know always, what I mean? it's, you're going to tell stories that are relevant to your I'm going to tell redemptive faith. stories yeah. every time, but they may include characters, like I say, as I crypt- cryptically said, that Christians don't always want to have to relate to. Yeah. Because we live in a world where everyone needs the gospel, regardless yeah. of who they are. I would say as an artist, you're a truth teller. The point of artistry, whether it's, painting, whether it's singing, the point of what you're doing is to tell the truth, is to reach the truth. Yeah. The most natural consequence of truth seeking is to find Jesus, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Because <laughs> he is the truth. A lot of people come to Hollywood because they feel called of God and then they fall away and they do crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. We're about to see a lot of them come back and the father's going to welcome them home with open arms throw a big party and it's going to be awesome. And it sounds like you're opening up a party center through your production company. (laughs) Here we go. No, seriously. Thank you so much for being on today. And thanks for just sharing so vulnerably and so real. And I feel like we just all went to school. Yeah. Yeah. You can't help it with Jesus. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And that was Jessica Yellow. You've been watching exploring the industry with Sean Bowles.